У нас сьогодні не пересічна подія. Традиційно ми з вами проводимо лекції, публічні лекції, публічні лекції в, на нашому факультеті з відомими людьми, які працюють в різних сферах. І цього разу, я б сказав, нам дуже пощастило, адже сьогодні в гостях ми маємо дуже досвідчену, визначну людину, яку, я думаю, вам буде корисно послухати і нам, направді, будете мати досвід спілкування на тільки світ. За сприяння Міністерства з питань тимчасових повних територій до нас сьогодні запитав пан Стефан Вайспі. Пан Стефан Вайспі є Є федеральним прокурором Швейцарської конфедерації. Він має дуже потужний досвід, дуже великий досвід роботи в Гаазькому трибуналі, якраз питань колишньої Йогославії. Сам пан Бареський отримав освіту спочатку в Швейцарії, а потім в Чикагському університеті отримав ступінь магістра права. Ну і далі вже мав відповідно отримував ліцензію як у Царіна на юридичну діяльність, так і в Нью-Йорку. Пан Веспі пройшов серйозно, це вона в днях 1030 днів служив в Збройних силах, де був командиром роти. Тривалий час був радником військового прокурора і, відповідно, мав навіть і, звичайно, приватну юридичну практику. Проте, якраз наша зацікавленість, і, зокрема, і наших студентів, які навчаються за, за програмою спеціального поврегулювання конфліктів, а також наших правників, це його діяльність і на посаді, і на посаді федерального прокурора, а також на посаді на пос... участь в трибуналі, в газовому трибуналі з питань колишньої Єгославії. Адже пан Веспі є досвід не тільки, до речі, про Єгославію, це і про проблеми інших держав, на інших континентах, зокрема і Конго і так далі. Тому я з великою приємністю хочу запросити до слова пана Веспі. Ну, а думаю, якраз і регламент, і формат не визначить для сам. Дякую. And uh, uh, my voice is a little bit uh, uh, sore because I've been sick for a while, so I hope I can uh, speak as clearly as I, I, I can. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to uh, this uh, lecture. I try to speak as slowly as I can so that the population can uh, catch up. Just to uh, make a point, I will make at the end for all your young students. If you want to work at the international level, and there are lots of jobs in international tribunals, it's absolutely essential that you speak English. So it's a little unfortunate that uh, you have to listen to the conversation. So I encourage you really to, uh, to uh, learn English. Let me start also thanking you, uh, in particular the elderly among you, for your tax money because as a UN staff member for 20 years I got a wonderful salary paid by the UN including the Ukrainian taxpayers so uh, thank you very much for that I would like to talk about the uh, 
the ICTY the International Criminal Tribunal for the for Yugoslavia and especially for you students I think uh, also given your age many of uh, uh, you probably don't know what Yugoslavia is and the brutal war that happened in the 90s so I give you uh, a quick rundown, uh, not of the history, but of the milestones, unfortunately, of the major crimes that occurred. Uh, I'll briefly also talk about some uh, legal issues, and then I will use a really interesting case, the case of uh, Slavko Dokmanovic. It's a, a typical but also untypical case. It was uh, the case about the Vukova Hospital. You'll hear about the facts. In November 91, one of the first events in the Yugoslav Civil War and also one of the first crimes. And it was investigated by the ICTY. It's also an interesting case because uh, the office of the prosecutor, of which I was part, was very creative in arresting Mrs. Dokmanovic. And you'll see how he did it. And uh, I will also show how the office of the prosecutor cracked his alibi, again in a fairly creative way. And the case took an unfortunate end, and I will talk about that uh, as well. So the ICTY was uh, a baby created by the United Nations, by the Security Council. Unlike the ICC, International Criminal Tribunal, which is a treaty-based court, countries have to ratify to be part of it. In principle, the ICTY was really imposed by the international community. And again, uh, you are so young, there was a time after the end of the Cold War, 92, that all major powers agreed on a few things. China, Russia, United States, India, UK, France. Something, unfortunately, that's not happening today. But at that time, in 1993, they decided, let's make a tribunal, an international tribunal to address the crimes in the former the Union. And uh, that's what they did. And uh, the tribunal lasted, uh, I'll come to that shortly, for 25 years, it's ending at the end of uh, last year. It also has a sister tribunal, we shouldn't forget that, ICTR in uh, Rwanda. Horrific crimes. Within a, a couple of months, in April, May 1994, about a million of uh, people who well, these were slaughtered, not by machine gun, but by machetes. So ICPR uh, represents a conflict uh, we shouldn't forget that. By the way, I'm happy to, to uh, give you the slides. Uh, they are simple and easy, so uh, if you have an example about that, show up on the side. Don't worry. Now, uh, just briefly, uh, we'll come to that. The substantive law is what's typical for international tribunals. It's a uh, genocide war crimes and crimes against humanity. 
guys is here, as you might know, also has a crime of aggression. Now for the ICTY, it was relatively successful. It indicted uh, 161 accused. And more or less all of them had to come to the Hague. It took 25 years. Perhaps you heard about Mr. Mladic, who came very late, but they all had to come. So that's uh, quite a success story for the international tribunals. And the range of accused is also extremely broad. It had presidents like Bredikovs, Yugoslavia, Serbia, uh, Milosevic, Milutinovic as well. We have uh, generals of all countries, Croatia, Bosnia, uh, Serbia. It had uh, ministers and it had common soldiers, policemen, who, for instance, tortured people uh, in camps or uh, killed them. So the whole range uh, of, uh, of accused. And interesting enough, it had 18 acquittals, uh, as far as I remember. Um, and that's quite healthy because the court not only convicts, sounds a little fishy to me because there are always mistakes made by the prosecution, and so a rate of 18 acquittals. In which case, obviously, is, is very different. He's, uh, he's I think, quite, uh, quite healthy. And I added the Ukrainian contribution because there was a, a judge. He was the judge in the case. I worked on prosecutor versus Blagojevich that dealt with uh, the massacre in Srebrenica. Wonderful, smart judge, Volodymyr Vasilenko. And we also had a Ukrainian uh, prosecutor, lawyer in the prosecution office from Odessa, Vladimir Tochilovsky. Super smart, brilliant lawyer. I think he now works for the UN in uh, uh, Geneva. So briefly, milestones of the uh, civil war. I started with, uh, and I'll show you a map of, uh, of uh, Yugoslavia in a second. So it started in Vukova, that was in Croatia, November 1991, and we'll talk about this, this crime in a little bit more detail. Then you have this ethnic cleansing in uh, Bosnia, with the concentration camps, you know, people killed, people evicted, um, deported, displaced, displaced. Then you have the famous siege of Sarajevo, the capital of Bosnia was under siege for three to four years, campaigns of sniping and shelling in the city, people wanted to get water, and the river, you know, were shot at by snipers, 500 meters away, lots of people killed, awful. Also there, the Yugoslav tribunal indicted uh, a few people. Then the reconquest of the Kaina, Croatia 1995, there we have the unfortunate acquittals, generals Kotovina, Markac and Cerma. Then, of course, the uh, war in Kosovo, Kosovo in 1999 and in Macedonia in 2001. If you want to categorize all the crimes that happened in the former Yugoslavia during the civil war, perhaps you can uh, think of four categories. You have the camp cases, kind of concentration camps. I'll show you a, a, a picture. There was one in Foča where girls younger than you were uh, incarcerated, raped multiple times for a long period of, uh, of time. Really, really awful. And also there we had a dedicated investigation team also 
comprised of only women who looked at these cases, investigated these cases, and we also got convictions, the names of Kunarat and Nogoniat uh, are perhaps a long Then the big massacres, Srebrenica, murder of uh, 8,000 plus Muslims, book of a hospital, our case today, and the third one, these large prostitution campaigns, ethnic cleansing, I mentioned already in Bosnia, and the fourth category is the most difficult, which perhaps is something uh, irrelevant to the Ukraine conflict crisis, uh, that's conduct of hostilities, urban warfare, sniping, shelling of, of, uh, of cities, that happens in uh, the Yugoslav civil war in Sarajevo, Tupovnik, wonderful city, ancient city on the Adriatic Sea, and the cities in Zagreb and Kandel. A couple of pictures. Um, maybe we can darken the room a little bit so we can see. Yeah. 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 Yes. Uh, on top left, you you can see a photo of, of Vukovar completely destroyed in 1991, with uh, civilians leaving. And that's the case I'll talk about. Top right is Dubrovnik. As I said, wonderful city, UNESCO protected, no military target in the city, and we are was bombarded by the enemy army. On the top uh, on the, the bottom left you see Sarajevo, what I mentioned before. You know, people who just need to get water, maybe even go to go to schools or do some clearly civilian activities were sniped at brutally terrorized day in, day out. So they were trying to, to cover. That's uh, the picture that you see here. Middle right, that's one of these camps. I think it's Olavska or Kronopolje in, in Bosnia. You see uh, men clearly uh, emaciated, um, hungry. Lots of people were killed in, in these camps. We also made several people responsible for what happened in these camps, including General Mladic. And the lower one on the right side, does somebody recognize this uh, picture? What does it represent? That's uh, Srebrenica. That's uh, one of these famous meetings in the Hotel Fontana on the eve of the massacre of uh, 8,000 Muslims. On the left side, General Mladic, who, as you might have heard, was convicted and the last year. And in the middle, uh, Colonel Kaiman, the Dutch Pet commander in the uh, unfortunately helpless role. Yugoslavia, as it doesn't exist any, anymore, so it's now split up into these various uh, countries, Croatia and so on. I'll just show you here the locations of the crimes I talked about. The green circle represents Vukova. That's a crime we will talk about, Vukova Hospital. On the left side, the yellow one is Brienno, that's where these camps were, concentration camps, or Mavsta, for example. The red spot in the middle is Sarajevo, capital of Bosnia. The uh, triangle, the blue one, is uh, Srebrenica. And the black circle at the uh, bottom is uh, Dubrovnik. All wonderful vacation. Journeys now, but 20, 25 years ago, it was happening. 
Another the case I want to talk about is the Mukova Hospital case. As I mentioned, it happened very early. People were happy in Yugoslavia, 80s, 90s, throughout, throughout its, uh, well, since its creation. But then nationalism uh, came up. Bukova was a typical example of a Habsburgian dual, all ethnicities, Hungarians, Jews, Germans, Croatians, Serbs, all uh, assembled, living happily together in, in Bukova. And then it was bombarded by the Yugoslav Serb forces, completely destroyed. And it fell on the 18th of November 1991, and lots of people left, almost everybody left Bukova because they were afraid of what's going to happen. Some people, many people, uh, tried to seek refuge in the hospital. There were patients in the hospital, but also other people tried to, to seek shelter. Then, two, three days later, on 21st of uh, November, we have the first known massacre in the Yugoslav Civil War at the farm of, of Jara. And I'll talk about that. 200, at least 200 known Serbs were brutally killed, executed. We had one survivor, a young man about your age, who about 500 meters before the execution site, just out of a blessing, thought that's not going to end well, and jumped off the truck and ran away. He could later tell the approximate location of the mass grave, and he was a witness, a protected witness, in the Dokmanovic trial. The, these events at of Char Bukova Hospital, the killing of 200 people, victims, was a uh, subject of, of an investigation by the ICDY and we indicted for the purpose of this lecture four people. Three of them, you see the, the photos, were JNA officers, meaning officers of the Yugoslav army, and these indictments were made public. One indictment against the mayor of Bukova, Slavko Dogmanovic, was not made public. Only very few people knew of that. Later, the three JNA general or officers were also tried, and you see here the result. Merksic got 20 years prison, Slivanchanin, whose picture you've seen in the first slide, and you'll see it again, got 10 years in prison, and Miroslav Vatic was acquitted. And you see here, given these fairly light um, sentences, and the time that has evolved since then, most of these prisoners, of these uh, people who were convicted, are free men now. Even of Srebrenica, people responsible for the killing of 8,000 people are now free men. One woman, Viliana Plastic, and they are all back in their communities. Let me tell you what, what happened at uh, this uh, Bukova hospital and of Jara farm. You see on the top right the Bukova hospital, of course, uh, renovated. 
structures are the same, but of course they look different. Uh, yes. So there, lots of people sought refuge, shelter under the protection of the Red Cross, they thought. Later, they were brought by buses, army buses, and, and uh, to the Ofchara farm, you see at the bottom right. And I'll show you a map in a moment. And there, at that location, people were kept for a few hours and were beaten, brutally beaten. But as far as I remember, nobody was killed. And at that location, the persecution said that Slavko Dokmanovic, the mayor, came and joined in beatings. Then, after a few hours, as mentioned in a few trucks, these 200 plus victims were driven to a large field, about a few hundred meters, a couple of kilometers away from Ofjara Farm. And there, on the 21st of November, they were killed, they were murdered. Mentioned the example for one person who was able to, to get released. Also, I have to add, at the Ofchara farm, this house, several people managed to get freed. Sometimes they knew somebody among the guards, and he said, okay, you can, you can leave. Or they were otherwise able to, to leave. And of course, these people, or some of these people were good witnesses for us because they were able to recognize who kept them, who tortured them. And two of these people recognized Slavko Tukmanovic being there. But look at the, the bottom right picture. That's a picture, I think, of Bukova, might have been also Sarajevo. How difficult it is to recognize soldiers, their appearance. There might be a militiaman on the left side, there might be a normal soldier, the second from left, then an old man, and then again somebody different in a different uniforms and to the right. Maybe somebody they call a Voivodina or one of these Sheshel's men. And that's difficult for witnesses and prosecutors. Because, especially when you talk about command responsibility, you need to be able to show that this person belongs to this unit. And one of the important features is his uniform. But if it's all different, that's uh, a tough challenge for prosecuting uh, offices. Now back to this uh, picture. On the left side is Slivanjani. He was a JNA officer, security officer, and his job was to apparently keep the ICRC, you see the gentleman on the right, away from the hospital. The picture was taken place, I think, on the 18th or 20th, if I remember correctly. And people knew exactly what was going to happen at the hospital. They feared for, for the worst. And the ICRC knew what was going to happen. That's why he tried, this gentleman, his name is Nikola Bozinger, to go to the hospital and take the names down, make a list. Always the best thing to name individuals because then they, there is a chance they won't be forgotten if they are named. But Major Slimanchny told him, no, it's too dangerous. There is combat. I cannot, for your security, your safety, I cannot let you to the hospital. And there is actually a video of that. And you see that Bosinger tries to argue, but I, I don't hear any combat, I don't hear shooting. Just uh, allow me to go. 
And you will kill the right thing to the But he wouldn't be allowed. <coughs> Interesting story also is the ICRC, International Committee for the Red Cross. It's the only organization because it's mentioned in the Geneva Conventions that they don't have to testify. So they have a privilege because of their, of their importance because if people knew that uh, the ICRC members could become a witness, they wouldn't talk to anyone because they feared whatever information they relate to the ICRC would end up somewhere else. That's why the ICRC has this uh, privilege. Um, being Swiss, I called him, I got his name, his name was known, I got his phone number and he said, sorry, would love to testify, I can't testify. But because of the video, these images, it, it was clear what uh, his role was and what he was trying to, uh, to do. Now Slavko Dugmanic, uh, you see his, his uh, data, I mentioned already the sealed indictment and the reason the ICTY sealed his indictment was there were lots of public indictments, 97, 98, but none of them, Karadzic, Vladic and lots of others were arrested. At the time, also way before your, your birthday, I guess, there were international troops, S4, I4 in Bosnia, Croatia, other, other parts. And they could have, they should have arrested these accused, but they didn't do it. That's why the team I was part of decided to be creative and thought on the leadership of the chief prosecutor, Luis Abor. Let's have this indictment confidential and try to bring him to Manovich, to lure him, to trick him from Serbia, where he lived, over the Danube, um, onto Croatian territory. And that Croatian territory was controlled, administered by UNTAIS, the UN, uh, I think the name was Transitional Authorities for Eastern Slavonia. And uh, the ICDU had the cooperation of a very, also very creative general, Jacques Klein, an American typically, who said, sure, bring him on, as soon as he crosses the Danube, we'll arrest him. So the ICDU talked to Dovmanovic. We had heard that he was interested in getting his real estate, his house back in Croatia. So uh, we said, you know, that's the job of Mr. Klein, Jacques Klein. He'll explain you how you get the, uh, the, uh, your house back, but you have to come to see him. So on 27th of June 1997, uh, investigators from the ICDY met Mr. Dogmanovic in Sobo in Serbia, drove him in the car, he voluntarily entered the car, that's important, because he knew he was going to meet Jacques Klein. He crossed the Danube, and as soon as he came on Croatian or UN administered soil, he was not yet arrested because uh, you know he thought everything was fine, but he was driven to Erdo to the UN base there, and there is a video of it, I think which is public by now. And then investigators open the door and arrest him and his colleague. He 
He had a good lawyer, Thomas Fila from Belgrade, and he said, this is kidnapping. So, yeah. we the UN kidnapping my client. You as the police, you have to be nice to people. You cannot cheat, you cannot be tricky. We said, no, it, it, it's fine, you know, it was all done on his free will. He entered the car on his free will. And the trial chamber looked into that. And they said, and you, you can read it here, the actual arrest, you know, the enforcement, the activities which inhibited him in his freedom happened on UN territory, not in, in Serbia. And also, there was no degrading inhuman or appalling behavior to say of Dogmanovic, but towards Dogmanovic. So the trial chamber says, if somebody is actually tortured, you know, uh, a suspect is tortured uh, by the police during a arrest, that might be too much. But because this didn't happen, it was actually a trial. Let me briefly tell you what uh, who the parties were to the trial. The presiding judge top right was uh, Antonio Cassese, you might have heard his name, he was an Italian judge, a Muslim person. He's really the, the father of international criminal law, the first president of the ICPY, he died meantime. On the left side is the uh, Judge May, British judge, who presided for the Milosevic trial later, he's also died meantime. Judge Mumba on uh, the right, then the chief prosecutor, he was, uh, looks like Churchill, but his name is Grant Neiman, he's from Australia, and uh, on top of the right you see Doma Fila, good lawyer from uh, Belgrade, he was uh, the lawyer of uh, Dokmanovic. Very briefly, the rules of procedure, you can read it later, but you have to imagine these rules or cultural activity as you know them from movies. First of all, although we don't have a jury, it's live witnesses. So each witness, each survivor, each expert, each journalist who testifies has to come live. So if you were the judges, you would sit here for half a year in this room and every day victims would come, videos would be shown and so on. That's really important because it was believed that the trials are so horrific that the judges who decide over the stigma of some sending somebody to prison for his life is so big that the judge really want to see the person, see how he reacts if he or she is asked questions, is he or she sweating, is he or she nervous. That's really important to to form his or her, uh, her own uh, um, impression. So it's not a paper trial; it's really life. But that means that certain people, for instance, surveillance of survivors, had to come eight times. Can you imagine you're a survivor of a massacre and you come eight times after telling the same story? And of course, your question cross examined by the defense. They tell you, well, you were here two years ago and you said that it was. Uh, uh, um, beautiful weather today, you talk about cloudy weather. Were you lying then or are you lying today? It's very difficult for, for these people. But the legal system demands it. And the onus is, is big on the witnesses. I know of a journalist, international journalist, worked for Sky News, who testified six, seven times. 
also in the Milosevic and uh, Vladi trial, he got traumatized. By giving evidence, reliving the uh, experience he, he testified about. Important is also that the whole trial is public. So you can go to the Hague, still today, before other tribunals, sit into the gallery, and unless there is a closed session, which barely happens, you can see what's happening. Even more, you can turn on the internet right now for the ICC, International Criminal Court, and you see the court, I think within a layer of 20 minutes, in case something happens. But it's enormously public, and that's really important because people, before Yugoslavia, they should know what's happening because justice is done in their name. The flip side of that is witness protection. Some witnesses were seen to the judges, to you, but not to the public in the gallery and certainly not to the audience on the internet. So they had a, a blurred face or their voice was distorted or they had a pseudonym or all of it together and in occasional cases rarely but it happened there was a closed session so only the judges could see the witness but nobody nobody else um, the role of judges every judge uh, used his role or um, uh, tried to find his own way. Some judges were just listening what happened before them, listening to the, to the witnesses, took notes, thought about it. Other judges were extremely active, asked questions, filled holes by the prosecution or by the defense of activist judges. The judges were also allowed to call their own witnesses, which is unusual in the Anglo-American system, because in the pure Anglo-American system, you are either a witness for the prosecution or for the defense. And the defense, I have lots of admiration for the defense. <coughs> because there are usually alone one, two, three people against the whole power of the international community, the UN. And a defense is extremely important, as you see in the case of the Kmanovich. Usually, the lawyer, your lawyer, is the only person who understands you, wants to understand you. In this, as it why the only guy who speaks your language, because the language of the court was English and French. Of course, the witnesses and the accused who spoke Serbian Croatian could use a language, but uh, I think it's really important to have a lawyer, obviously, who understands you. Back to the Dokmanovic trial. We have talked about his arrest, 27th June, 97. A few days later, he had his initial appearance, so the first time he appeared before the judge. Only half a year later, the trial started, opening statements. And you see the closing arguments, the Gledway 
took place um, half a year later, which is fantastic. Because normal these trials, because as I mentioned, the witnesses have to come, and each of the witnesses and talk for half a day, a day, a week, two weeks. So much has happened. So these trials last two, three, four years. Too long. But Dokmanovic was compact, and one of the reasons was Judge Cassese, presiding judge, just wanted to finish the case. So what was Slavko Dokmanovic accused of? As I mentioned, he was seen by two witnesses at the farm, of Jara farm, where he joined in the beatings of these people. So, he was a co-perpetrator of inhumane treatment, crime against humanity, of these 200 serving victims. We also charged him with the execution, the murder of the 200 victims. So what we had to prove as a prosecution, we had to prove that these victims were beaten, that they were tortured, and that they were killed. That's number one. That's not too difficult. You have uh, eyewitnesses to the beatings. You have the forensics, the dead bodies. You know, dead bodies having blindfolds. Their hands tied behind their backs, bound together. You have the age of people killed, you know, a ten year old girl. All these together prove that these people were dead and massacred, didn't die as in, in combat. The challenge always is. A linkage. <laughs> Defense can say we accept that these people were killed, 200 people. What do you have on my client? You know, has he been seen shooting? Do you have a weapon with his finger, tips on it? That's the difficult part. So, in this half a year of testimony, of, uh, of trial, you can see here we had 43 witnesses. We had the survivor. We had mothers of people killed who testified. Yes, this is, I think, a teddy bear. We found a teddy bear. This is the teddy bear I gave to, to my boy before he was taken away. We have forensic experts who said we found, I don't know, five blindfolds, 200 bodies, they were shot by, by gunshot wounds, and not because uh, they died of a heart attack or something, that's forensic. The defense also called 42 witnesses. Including Dokmanovic, the accused. So what was the alibi? What, what was the, to, to say the better, the defense strategy? They said Dokmanovic was not guilty because he was certainly not at the crime scene at the Vichara where the people were executed. And I think he remember his defense counsel said, okay, if he was at the farm, 
We deny that, and I'll come to that. He was there only very briefly. Now, what did the defense do? They had the key piece of evidence, the Alibi video. And on this Alibi video, which unfortunately I, I couldn't find, you see Dokmanovic, the mayor of, Ser of uh, Vukova, and a few of other mayors of similar cities in Serbia driving around the destroyed Vukova, filming each other, filming destruction, celebrating that Vukova is now Serbian. Toma Fida gave us this video to show his client was somewhere else, was not in Ovchar. That was his case. Because if his client was in Ovchar, that will be the first step for a, a conviction. So, in showing this Alibi witness uh, video to witnesses, the defense created the impression that the Alibi video at a certain location, which I'll show you to in a moment, showed Dokmanovic at a location away from the Oftara farm at the time he was to, supposed to be in Oftara. The culmination of our case was that we were able to find a tree expert. And his job was to look at the location the defense says Dokmanovic was in the video and the real location where the prosecution said he was. And to do that, this tree expert or civic culturist looked at certain trees and compared them with each other. Here you see the chart. Vukovar is up north on, on the Danube. And the defense always said that on the video you could see Dokmanovic being here. So he drove with his fellow members in the car. And the video shows him here. Which means if he was really here, he couldn't be at the same time in Ovchara where the people were tortured and where the one has been seen by two people and then executed. Now this tree expert looks at the trees which you can see on the video and thought, I don't think these trees are here. He looked around and found actually the tree that's on the video on point A here. How did the expert do that? That's a tree at point A. He looked at the video, here you see a still from the video top left. And if you look at closely, it shows 20 November 91 at 1542. That's when the video was taken. You can see a bus. <coughs> Sorry. The top of a bus with refugees. So this was filmed from the car of Dokmanovic. And you see a tree in the house. And this tree expert now compared the angles of this tree with the angles of the tree 
of a photo he took um, ten years later. So he took the steel from the video of the tree, supposedly. Here, but he thought it was here and compared it with the actual tree 10 years later, which was that coin A. And he compared the angles of the tree, and I never understood it, certainly don't understand it now how it worked, but it looked very impressive. And he provided a report which is public, you can see it, I made a copy here. And he says that this particular tree is a very specific tree, so it's almost unique to the area. A walnut, Juglans regia. And he said that he was able to identify that it was the same tree shown in video segment 1542. And then he explains that trees are like people. You know, their character stays the same over time, although their appearance, like a self, completely changes in 20 years, as you see in a moment. So he writes trees extend from their tips as they grow. And existing branches grow in girth, but the pattern of branches is preserved and can be recognized. That means that if this tree who was supposed to be here was here, he would actually Dokmanovic turn, I think the turn is here to this year for the and reach uh, of Charlie. Yeah, maybe, well, Charlie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the And I can tell you, although yeah, the uh, mathematics and the expertise is one thing, to be able for the judges to see in court the expert witness, the tree expert testifying to observe Dokmanovic, how he reacts to that, how the other people in courtroom is, is priceless and is just very, very important. Then there was another witness, it's a rebuttal witness. As I explained, it's like a chess game. First, prosecution has its witnesses, then the defense witnesses, and then for new issues, the prosecution has rebuttal witnesses, so it's a second round, and the defense would have rejoinder witnesses. And equally important to the tree expert was witness R. And we discovered witness R because somebody on my team looked at all German books about the former Yugoslavia, about the fall of Zukova. And thought, okay, if Dokmanovic was so important, Maybe, you know, some journalist uh, wrote something about it. You also have to, to see that the whole office of the prosecutor was fairly American. Also, members, most members were, uh, certainly the senior lawyers were from the US, which has, as a concept, Consequence that also key witnesses, journalists, were always from CNN, from Sky News, you know, Martin Bell, the, the uh, journalist, uh, and uh, other people testified. So nobody really looked at uh, French 
German no, speaking world, Austrian, who uh, was much closer to the Fobi and Slavia. So this person went to bookshops, just took out books, Fobi and Slavia, and found Dogmanovic mentioned. And Dogmanovic was mentioned by witness R. You see a protective witness. This protective witness was, and again that's from Yugoslavia, a doctor from Syria. Because Yugoslavia was very close at that time to the Arab world. non aligned movement of Tito, of Nero, and so on. So lots of doctors, uh, Arab doctors, worked in and other people in from Yugoslavia. So this Syrian doctor was a family friend of Dogmanovic, played football with him. And also Dogmanovic said during trial, as many accused do in these situations, you know, I'm a friend of Muslims, I'm the mayor of everybody, don't care whether Croatian servants or now this witness said, the day of the fall of Vukovar, I was evicted or had to leave with my family to Serbia, taken by bus or somehow. So I saw Dogmanovic, my man, my family friend, whose doctor I was, and asked for his help. He just turned around. And again in court, when this doctor, again, despite the fact he had a pseudonym, you know, Dokmanovic could see his face, he could see, uh, knew his name. You could see how the accused of money just collapsed, you know, his whole story about this uh, wonderful mayor for everybody uh, collapsed. And you see this piece of evidence has not much to do about the actual crime, about the killing or the presence of Dogmanovic at the scene, but it impacted hugely on this credibility. Less than a week after the testing of Witness R, and about a week before the trial was supposed to end with the verdict by President Garcese, Dogmanovic committed suicide in Mother Now you see uh, the way not only trees but also persons look completely different. That's a picture of myself in 1998 at the trial. So only a few of you would have recognized me. Even I have difficulties. The last uh, slide, again it's available to you. The legacy of the ITY 25 years of trials, long trials, expensive trials, but I think it was worthwhile. All 161 accused had their day in court. Victims could come to the, to the judges and tell their stories if they wanted. There were convictions. There was a huge amount of jurisprudence. What is genocide? What are the elements of command responsibility? And also, I think, for me, the most important, it shows that it's important, that it's possible to investigate these horrific crimes of this complex, complex nature, Srebrenica, 10 or 20 years after they happened, from The Hague, 
hundreds of kilometers away from where it happens. Against the state at that time, Republic of Serbia didn't like us. With witnesses, many of them said, I don't want to come to the aid. You know, I suffered enough. My house still doesn't have a roof. Why should I come to the Hague and relieve the, uh, the trauma? But many witnesses came and helped us present evidence. The Bosarati Tarrant, uh, the ICDY, he did have a reconciliation from the Yugoslavian people are very skeptical about it. But, uh, so that's something for your class to think about whether these tribunals have the inherent effect. I'm myself a little bit skeptical. But at least we have collected the facts. They are in, in the judgments. And I think nobody can deny that horrific stuff happened in Serbenica, for example. Genocide and crimes against humanity. So without these judgments, I think these myths and legends would, would keep on going for generations so that in itself is, is, a, is a, a plus and finally i started with this point uh, job opportunities all these many tribunals here in the hague but elsewhere they have internships and there are Jobs for interpreters, for lawyers, for analysts, for historians, some of you might be interested in, in that. So, um, or if you want to work in the UN, elsewhere, you should really try, for instance, as a UN volunteer, you should put yourself on the list. So, uh, there is lots for you out to. Uh, to adventure out what you have done And finally, research topics. It, it's, a, it's a bonanza of uh, topics. So just take the witnesses, you know. How did the witnesses fare? Was it good or bad that they testified? In The Hague? How do they feel a year afterwards? Do they uh, regret coming to the Hague? And so on. So there is for social for sociologists like you, for lawyers, millions of, uh, of topics. And with internet, it can be researched from uh, Kiev, like you were in the Hague. Uh, so thanks for your your patience uh, listening. If you have questions or comments or criticism, please have to answer it. Масштабное и систематическое нападение на гражданских лиц. 
То есть все эти преступления, которые вызывают к достижению против человечества, должны осуществляться в рамках широкомасштабного и систематического нападения на гражданских лиц. И вот э, вопрос, а все-таки, когда рассматривается дело, а именно в рамках статьи, когда рассматривается именно вопрос, имело ли место широкомасштабное и систематическое нападение на гражданских лиц, что является допустимыми доказательствами, что считается достаточным доказательством Well, thank you very much. That, uh, that's a great and very knowledgeable uh, questions, question. And um, maybe for the benefit of uh, people less knowledgeable than you, your colleague talks about uh, crimes against humanity. And in order to prove a crime against humanity, murder or a rape or extermination, there is a so-called chapeau element, which means before you can even start to prove murder or extermination, you have to prove, as you rightly point out, that the crime was part of a widespread or systematic attack against the civilian population. That means not every crime can be a crime against humanity. It shouldn't be only really the big crimes. So what would judges accept uh, as uh, evidence to prove crime uh, uh, is widespread or systematic? I think, uh, unlike in the real Anglo-American legal system, with certain rules, exclusion of types of evidence, history, for instance, at the international level, as far as I know, you can bring whatever you want, as long as it's uh, probative, relevant, and has probative value, so uh, document has probative value. If you know who has written this report, maybe the date, just a piece of paper, probably not. So, because this shock element of widespread systematic is fairly broad concept, and you cannot prove every single point. I think to prove this condition for crimes against humanity, you probably don't need direct evidence. You are not going to bring witnesses who can see widespread uh, attacks, which means his witness has seen lots of it, not just one event, but many. Except, perhaps, a journalist who has covered a certain period of time, who can say, absolutely, you know, I've been there for three months, every day something has happened. I've seen it in this city, in every suburb, because I traveled, so for me it was systematic. So somebody like a overview witness could testify as to the widespread or systematic error. Also important is evidence by NGOs. These are great people, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and you name it, whose job is to collect information, give them a certain systematics, source them, which means they are reliable. So if you have an NGO report who again says, over a period of time, you know, we have collected information about 50 murders, about 20 rapes. That would also be, in my view, a typical, valuable piece of evidence to uh, 
proof of the white paper systematical character um, of, of uh, your crimes. yesterday to, to look into the ingredient question but I didn't uh, the way I understood it but I'm really not sure is that the ICD has actually started a preliminary investigation a few years ago and uh, I think they have received lots of information from lots of people and institutions so uh, they will assess now what they have whether it's sufficient threshold for the jurisdiction of the ICC you also know that the ICC is really a court of last resort so the ICC, because it's such a small organization for the whole world, they only act when the normal courts in Ukraine are unwilling or unable. So perhaps uh, the ICC will see that the authorities in the region do their job. They collect the information, they investigate, they do trials. So there is no need for the ICC to step in. So I'm myself curious what the ICC will do and what the Ukrainian authorities and the local authorities do in their duty to investigate crimes. And uh, perhaps next time I'll visit Ukraine. No more. Such, and in this uh, court 
real good process and uh, how to say it. Uh, uh, from your experience, uh, take uh, you uh, 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 took part in this process. Uh, I'm interested in your experience, your view of this uh, event. <coughs> Thank you very much for this uh, really interesting question. In my view, uh, as always been my view, the influence or the impact of the American lawyers was uh, absolutely positive. Actually, one of the key reasons for success. But not because of their influence and they try to directly, but because of their expertise. You have to say that, uh, first of all, law is uh, working with words. And you started your question by saying it's not my, my native language, and neither it is mine. So, if you are in court and uh, your colleagues, you know, have this wonderful uh, uh, American uh, speech, and uh, that's already uh, that's quite an advantage uh, for, for them. That, that's just a, a, a starting point. They were just good, you know. Their drafting was good, which is natural because it's a language. But also because I said the system was Anglo-American. Of course, we had the jury. But many of these legal concepts, plea agreements, for instance, but also the, the drafting of motions, the drafting of indictments, opening statement, closing statement, cross-examination, something non-American, non-British, non-Australian lawyers are not really good at. So they learned that in their schools, and they were really, really good at it. Yeah. Second or third, because they knew each other, they knew where they were coming from. They trusted each other. They knew this guy practices in New York or in, in whatever Montana, so it's the same culture. So it was a fairly homogeneous office with a few exotic people like uh, Vladimir Torchinovsky, who is as good at least as the Americans. And his legal thinking. We had a couple of Germans and, and, and others. But uh, the Americans were really the, the tree expert, the, the idea about the seed indictments and other ideas about the subpoenas. Uh, actually, to, to show you the intercept, uh, if we have time. A wonderful intercept that was found. Uh, there was an idea of an, of an American. So that American spirit, professionalism, uh, was uh, was unique. Um, and they just the reason they were there is uh, because the U.S. government thought it's a good idea to have this tribunal in the Hague. Let's send some people. And uh, I think without them, it would have been much slower. The underlying nature of your question, whether they had any undue influence, not to my knowledge, uh, but of course I'm, I wasn't privy to, to their conversations uh, with, with others, I have no idea, but the colleagues I worked with, uh, uh, Extremely professional, uh, great, uh, great people. Thank you. Uh, now cross examination starts. Not, not, only, <laughs> not only America's uh, America's um, prosecutors are professionals. German, French, American. USA and Yugoslavia, two main kilometers. Why USA? Why America's prosecutors? I completely agree with you. And certainly on the procedural rules, 
I wondered myself whether in the middle of Europe, far away from the, uh, the US and even England, we had a, a court dealing with the former Yugoslavia that was based on, on common of rules. I, I always understood it. But as maybe you remember, I heard, I learned to appreciate it. You know, the, 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 uh, this chess game, the uh, transparency of cross-examination that really brings to light lots of bad things. So I think that for these kind of war crimes, with its stigma attached to being a war criminal, even indicted war criminal, is huge. So to bring it to light, uh, it's slower, but I think it's, it's juster uh, at, at the end. So I think uh, from that perspective, I understood at the end why, why the, uh, the Anglo-American rules. But the other fact is just a, a fact of life. If the Germans had brought in 20 German prosecutors who were capable of speaking English, unless German was a, a language of the court, which was impossible politically, even French was difficult. But even today, everybody speaks English. So, like if you work in Mercedes or in some other company, it's just English. It's a fact of life. And I mentioned that you should come to the Hague as interns. You know, most of our interns in the Hague came from the US. America, Australia, far, far away. They were just more adventurous than Swiss. You could almost commute every day from Switzerland to the Hague or from Cologne to the Hague. But the Swiss and the German and Austrian and the students, they want to be at home. That's a difference to the Americans. Also, you always have in the Americans, at least that's my experience, are that spirit of bringing peace and justice to the region. Maybe you have the similar experience in the Ukraine. So the Americans like to lecture and export human rights with your own doubtful record at home. That's just the American. So going back, if the French or the Germans or the Swiss have sent 20 prosecutors, French speaking, that's also possible. The UN would have gladly accepted it. But the only guys who came forward were, were just the, the Americans and the Australians. It's just the way it happened in 1994. Today it might be uh, 20 Ukrainian lawyers who will start to uh, put forward when uh, tribunal in Syria is great. You never know. That was just the dynamics of the day. Language was suitable to them, legal system was suitable to them, they were available, they were initially seconded by the State Department, although later they had to become normal UN personnel. But I, I can tell you, in terms of professionalism, of, of uh, legal reasoning, the, as I mentioned, the North American colleagues were as good, if not better, as the Great, I think you deserve a coffee. I certainly do. <laughs> Thank you.
And, and please, if, if uh, maybe when you wake up, you have uh, another question, uh, you can search it by your teachers and uh, Mr. Rüche send me your question. Or you see me, if you're interested in the UN careers, if you want a piece of advice or ideas about research, you may have a question. After in English, though, not in your mother tongue. Let me ask you a question. Uh, what do you think about the uh, conception of restorative justice? Can we combine retributive uh, justice and restorative justice uh, in context of international tribunal? I'm not so versed in these concepts. Can you briefly explain each of them? Uh, retributive justice as a part of criminal process and restorative justice as deals with reparations, with uh, uh, truth, healing, and reconciliation process. Sorry? I've all, also spent the year, maybe your, your uh, dean has mentioned, in the DRC, the Congo, uh, actually returned there. And there, these alternative concepts, like also tri tribal justice uh, are much more common. I think for each country or each conflict you have to have a different solution. Um, but for the top guys, for the key architects, you always have to have um, tribes, criminal tribes. That's really my my uh, my uh, thinking after my experience. You know, the most important and the worst people are the commanders of the and the top commanders, politicians, not the lower people. Even if lower-ranking soldiers kill five, ten people. Of course, I need to be punished, but I really believe strongly that unless um, uh, that these people act according to orders, according to propaganda, according to education in schools. So for me, the key people are the top guys, and you cannot take away the responsibility of the top guys by some restorative process like retribution uh, or so. Um, I also, from Yugoslavia, I mentioned it. One guy came as a survivor survivor said, you know, because I said, you need to come back for another place. I said, why do you come back? Come to my house. You know, the UN is there, has these wonderful blue roofs, these fancy cars. I still don't have a house, a roof over my house. Why should I care about justice? Okay. <coughs> For me, that would be very important. Other people, the mothers of Zerita, they just want justice. So it really differs. It differs in people, and I think it differs in, in countries, certainly continents. The, the concept of peace for Rwanda. Who is a wonderful modern quasi dictatorial country 25 years after genocide? Why does almost all these people? Um, so somehow they, they did well, while others around Rwanda didn't do so well. Why? If you go to Rwanda, you know the streets are nicer than in Switzerland. It's really uh, amazing how they dealt with the genocide. They have this ICDR, they have these Gajaksa trials, they have other things. I think it's really, it's the mix of solutions which has to be commensurate with, with people. So the concept of what I said before, choking me, but it's really true. The Americans or the UN coming to bring peace and justice 
to the region, Ukraine, Syria, and so on. It always has to be rooted in, in, in the normal people, you know, the, the victims, the local journalists, the, the culture. But at the end, I really believe strongly in that. The most important people, I won't name names, these are the guys. Because you don't force a person to become president of the country. You don't force a person to become a general. You don't force a person to become a prison director. So if they are in those positions, it's their duty to, to act. And if they don't act, despite the fact that they know that people are torturing their prisons, it, it's their duty and they have to be criminally uh, responsible and uh, totally convinced of that. Это 
непосредственно в нашем регионе, для того, чтобы, соответственно, могли быть спокойны участники в принципе, на сегодня необходимо укреплять международное присутствие. Сегодня оно, на мой взгляд, является недостаточным, потому что а, прошло уже сколько три года в момент описания Минских соглашений, а, к сожалению, вооруженные действия продолжаются, продолжаются так называемые конституционные бои, когда а, из окопов а, двух сторон произвели с двух сторон имеют нарушения а, данных Минских соглашений. Цена этому, к сожалению, кончилась в человеческой жизни. И там ежедневно, по крайней мере, те данные, которые были, можно сказать, что ежедневно погибает от трех тысяч человек минимум. И это очень начальная специфика. И что то надо с этим делать? Можно все-таки вопросы перейти? Я думаю, что мы с коллегой подали для участия в спорте. Это мероприятие, которое было в Львове. И в этом году, в частности, там была главная ситуация с кожей, которая в Украине в 2014 году. И вопрос о факте иммунитета. В частности, как я сказал, что прошедшее рассмотрение ситуации в Югославии, процесс расследования против тех людей, которые занимали должностные позиции, были ли те, чьи адвокаты, чья сторона, чья защита и вообще клиенты, которые заявляли о том, что они обладают каким-либо иммунитетом и просили их отсылающих для юридических судов на основании иммунитета? Какая была позиция суда в отношении So for the ICY, the, the case was clear, that's why you had uh, Minosevic and uh, Karadzic, all these people. But it's a live issue, as you know, at the ICC. I think there's still an issue about the president of, uh, of um, Sudan, Bashir, whether it's possible that he might join the movie. Generally, at the international courts, not like national courts, international level, it's generally accepted that there is no immunity. You might recall that the president of Kenya, Kenyatta, and his, his deputy also had to appear before the ICC when the trial started, but then collapsed because I think uh, some witnesses didn't come. So at the international level, uh, I think you can safely say there is no It's different at the national level. Um, for instance, uh, in Switzerland, the case I tried was against uh, was started against uh, General Nizar, the who was the defense minister of Algeria during the Algerian civil war, 91, 92, 93, and uh, in Switzerland. We have a law that says it's principle of universality with some restriction. So even if the crimes didn't happen in Switzerland, no victims in Switzerland, no perpetrators in Switzerland, Swiss courts still have jurisdiction if the accused comes to Switzerland. For instance, going shopping with his wife in Geneva, check his bank account in St. Moritz, or doing something else. The moment he comes to Switzerland, and there's an NGO that files a request or a victim, we have to try. So that happens with General Neza. He came to Geneva, I think he wanted to consult a psychologist 
because he wanted to quit smoking. So uh, an NGO kicked up, he was there, and uh, made a, a claim against the prosecutor's office, and we started the case. And his defense said, as the Minister of Defense, at the time of the fact, he's immune. That the Swiss federal court said no. So even for a national court, uh, there is now precedent with this case that there is no immunity for uh, for a high dignitary. Any questions? No. Хотів би я вірю в Україну language because хотів би подякувати вам від імені нашого університету, від імені нашого університету, я думаю, що нашого факультету, відповідаючи на ваше питання. Я вже задумав, як тут сприймається ОБСЄ, ПЕДГАЙС, ОБУДГАЙС, більшість населення країни. Воно не зовсім цікавиться, не детально цікавиться ролі цих організацій, не зовсім розуміють, що відбувається, яке призначення цих організацій і які є завдання. Але ті люди, які тут навчаються, викладають, бачать це так. Україна зараз є полем бойових дій між великими країнами. США, Російська Федерація, інші країни, Європейський Союз, просто полем бойових дій. Можливо, на території країни відпрацьовуються якісь механізми поведінки в подібних ситуаціях. Можливо, різні країни захищають свої інтереси на території цієї країни. Можливо, нам небагато що кажуть, ми небагато що можемо дізнатися, зрозуміти, що відбувається. Але це точно, що Україна зараз як територія держава, можливо, більше розглядається як об'єкт геополітики, ніж як суб'єкт тих відносин, в яких Можливо, вона хотіла брати участь, тому що тут проживають розумні люди, можливо, не зовсім розумно керовані, але люди, які бажають стати суб'єктом політики, а не лише бути полем бойових. Якщо було більше людей, які цим цікавилися, ми бачимо навіть серед студентів, небагато питань щодо ролі ОПСЄ, щодо ролі таких подібних процесів, перерів у їх. Суму освітлюють на ваше питання. Люди мало цікавляться цим, в тому числі ролі ОПСЄ. Але якщо подивитись на неї об'єктивно, ОПСЄ, я вважаю, вона відстоює свої інтереси або інтереси тих країн, які її вирубували, які стейкхолдер в жизнедіяльності. Know that it is uh, hard for you because you're sick of the talk. So, uh, uh, thank you, uh, all uh, participants of uh, this seminar. Uh,